Hi, and welcome to another video from the CTAG Clinic. My name is Dr. Mike Lloyd, and I'm the Clinic Director. In the video today, I'm going to be trying to answer a question that was put to me recently, which I thought was really, really fascinating because it, it draws on a sense of what attachment means for both complex trauma and dissociation. And the question was essentially whether or not parts, i.e. those within either OSDD or DID systems, could have different attachment styles. Now, I thought this was a really obvious question because my immediate response was, yes, absolutely, I believe that they can do. But then it got me thinking about how this might break down and, and why this might actually be the case. So if the instinct is to say, yes, I think parts can have different attachment styles, what, the, what might this be a response to? So why would this actually happen? And it's largely because within complex trauma and dissociation, we are thinking that attachment styles are absolutely central to the core of the nature of this. So attachment is often the thing that leads to what complex trauma ends up providing, which is a disorganized attachment style. Because the, the disorganized or the difficult attachment experiences, they often lead to a lack of integration of the processes that, that, that lead to general or no, normal, ordinary personality functioning and development. So the traumatic experiences early in childhood break down the build of the personality and it causes this fragmentation and the fragmentation is what sits around the heart and the core of the trauma to protect the self, the sense of self, the identity from the traumatic experiences. So it's a way of being able to manage the events that are taking place over sustained periods of time. Again, that's where we come back to that complexity. It's the frequency, the duration, the repeated quality of these traumatic events that are taking place. So when traumatization is occurring throughout early childhood, the brain is manifesting a, a system by which to try and maintain survival of the ultimate organism, to try and keep the body alive and try and keep the sense of self as protected as possible. Now, the fragmentation is going to happen. And because this often takes place in childhood, it's more often than not related to the caregivers or the people in close proximity to that individual who's undergoing those traumatic experiences. So those are our attachment figures, it could be parents, could be siblings, grandparents, close family members or people with whom we would expect there to be a normal attachment bond being generated. The nature of those relationships, the difficult experiences that are taking place lead to a breach in the ordinary pr progress and, and build of a, what we would call a secure attachment system. So children coming out of very, very difficult and, and traumatic type environments often end up with disorganized or insecure attachment styles. And because fragmentation can take place, parts then start having different functions and different elements of them, which are related to the nature of the survival of that, of that person. So each part is about trying to maintain survival and the attachment system is the thing that has led to the fragmentation. So it would make sense that each part then has a necessary function within the attachment system to try and maintain survival. Now, this might sound a little bit complicated, but I'm, I'm hoping it, I can break it down by thinking about insecure attachment, let's say in three basic domains. So we have the anxious, we have the avoidant, and we have the disorganized. And within this, there are different elements of ambivalence and fear and dismissive type approaches. So children can develop all of these kind of different ways of relating to the people around them in what we would ultimately think of as an insecure attachment system. So if an individual through a complex trauma type experience is fragmenting into OSDD or DID type internal systems, then it would make sense that the different elements of those internal systems might carry different attachment styles because each one of those attachment styles may be more or less useful for the survival of the ultimate person. So let's say there will be some circumstances where a part would need to be avoidant. There are some circumstances where a part would need to be dismissive or ambivalent or fearful and or, or overly anxious because these can have protective qualities. And it will be a lot to ask for one part to hold all of those different attachment styles. So therefore, it makes sense that each individual part may adopt a specific element of the insecure attachment system in order to be present to create survival at that moment in time.
So it could be for any one part, they might need to be more ambivalent. They might need to be more anxious. They might need to be more um, uh, dismissive or avoidant. So those parts can then interchange according to the needs of the environment within which they're in to allow that survival to take place. So it could be that in, in one circumstance, an avoidant part is needed, but then if an anxious or fearful part is needed to do something else, then that fragmentation takes place and the switch occurs between those different parts within the system. It made sense to think then that parts could create within themselves a singular type of attachment style in order to meet a singular survival need, but that some parts are gonna have increasing complexity and can have different things. So let's say one part might be completely anxious, one part might be completely avoidant, and another part might have a blend of anxious avoidance or ambivalence. And I couldn't really see why that wouldn't take place. And that might explain a lot of the functioning, how, how relationships in the world get so difficult around OSDD and DID systems because one part is looking to move forward in a relationship, let's say, and one part is looking to move away. And that conflict creates a lot of the distress and stress that occurs within people with OSDD and DID, which we nearly always see. So I'm just wondering whether or not that yes answer is, is down to this. And I'm sure that there is some great research out there that's been done on this and I'm gonna go start digging around and having a look at this because I do do a lot of work and thinking about attachment systems and, and working out the attachment systems within these very, very specific internal dissociative systems might actually be really productive for us to understand why it's so difficult to integrate ultimately because if all of these different attachment systems are at play. The integration of them all at the end stage of therapy can be really difficult if we don't have a handle on what the attachment systems actually are, because we're talking about bringing in maybe polarized opposite types of attachment systems together. And that's obviously gonna be a very difficult thing to do, which is why integration is nearly always a very difficult thing to do. So I hope that that has, that has answered the question. I've, I've had this conversation with the person who asked it and we kind of came to an agreement on these things, but it, this, the video really has allowed me to just go into a little bit more detail and, and try and make sense of that. And I'd be really interested to see what, what thoughts are on this, whether I might be right, whether I might be wrong with this. And, uh, and we'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll always keep coming back to this because attachment is so integral to this whole process of complex trauma and dissociation. So I hope this has been helpful. I look forward to reading the comments. And uh, as always, between now and the next video, please do take great care.